Playing around the many threatening offensive Pokemon in the game is quite difficult, and it seems to get tougher with each generation, with new threats and new ways of making old threats more dangerous alike. Answers to them exist, but with Pokemon getting stronger and stronger in tumultuous metagames where speed and power are crashing into each other until one player sends out the fastest and strongest of all, what vestige of counterplay is there left? The answer, priority moves. In-game, we often forget these moves once we have a few badges under our belt. Yeah, Monferno's Mach Punch is great at first, but eventually it'll become Infernape, and you'll want to move on to close combat. However, in the competitive scene, players have long used these priority moves despite their lower power level because of how important moving and hitting first can be in a seemingly endless number of situations. You may not be able to withstand its hits, but you can hit it first, and that can be game-changing. Of course, this is just defensive uses of priority, used to help check Pokemon. They are also offensive forces, useful for wall breaking and sweeping alike. Sometimes priority even clashes. We'll be exploring the rich history of priority moves today. They may not quite be everything, but they sure do count for a whole lot. This is why priority moves are close to everything, or the Scizor Theorem. Priority has been around since Gen 1, which had Quick Attack, one of Ash's Pikachu's favorite moves. It helped beat Lieutenant Surge's Raichu after all, but it wasn't used competitively. Its distribution was limited to mostly terrible Pokemon like Ninetales, Pidgeot, Raichu, Raticate, Scyther, and the Evolutions. Of course, one of the Evolutions was an exception, since Jolteon was a strong OU choice, but it was also the fastest Pokemon in the tier, making Quick Attack a complete waste on it, especially since it had a terrible attack stat and had better moves to be using to boot. Things didn't really change in Gen 2 either. Quick Attack's distribution remained limited to abysmal Pokemon or what was wasted on those which wouldn't use it, like Raikou. The closest it got to viability was Scizor, but Swords Dance boosting priority was not as good as it would be in later gens, when the priority in question was non-stab, hit nothing super effectively, and was in an incredibly bulky generation. Quick Attack was no longer the only priority around in Gen 2 though. It now had a cousin in Extreme Speed, which was much rarer, had much less PP, and was twice as strong. Sadly, Sadly, it wasn't very good either. Once again, the lack of a stab, super effective hits, and an incredibly bulky generation whose form of speed control tended towards paralysis meant even the solid attack stats of Arcanine and Dragonite weren't going to be e-speeding anything too effectively. Even if you tried boosting them with Curse, the aforementioned problems still applied. You could try Belly Drum Extreme Speed Smeargle, who got stab on the move and could max out its attack, plus Spore let it shut something down guaranteed, so it could get turns to set up, so it didn't sound terrible terrible on paper, but it was indeed terrible in practice, as it was still pathetically weak and frail to boot, and so you wouldn't actually try Drum Smeargle. Mach Punch also came into existence in Gen 2, but seeing as its users were the Hitmon Trio, none of which were good, even the prospect of Curse backed by stab priority with actual super effective targets failed to leave any sort of mark. Priority pretty much didn't exist in the first two generations, competitively speaking, but in Generation 3, things began to change. Not too drastically, but still a significant departure from their previous stature. As far as OU was concerned, priority still didn't exist for a very long time. Choice Band Metachamp was quite gimmicky, but it could use the newly added Fake Out, the newly added Choice Band was nice for priority moves, which were all physical, and the lack of max out EVs across the board meant they hit harder, especially against their main targets, faster, frailer Pokemon. Anyway, Metachan didn't really have anything else it needed to do, so it could afford Fake Out, but this didn't have any sort of impact, and as Metachan was further explored, these strategies were relegated to other options. Sadly, Dragonite lost extreme speed in Generation 3. Otherwise, it would have had quite a niche. The lack of priority in the tier was often on display with how commonly fast sweepers finished games with extremely low health. Dragon that Salamence, Salak Berry Heracross, Choice Band Aerodactyl, meaning they could afford to take a hit while positioning themselves for a sweep, something far less prominent in later generations, where such Pokemon would need to remain in pristine condition so they wouldn't fall into priority range. It wasn't until the discovery of Breloom being actually viable that Advance gained its first genuinely good priority user, with Breloom's Mach Punch fitting the bill for what priority should be perfectly. Stab, plenty of significant targets, and coming off of a massive base 130 attack. Mach Breloom didn't shake the metagame to its core or anything, but it did provide many significant developments. Most notably, the best possible revenge killer to the most defining sweeper in the tier, Dragon Dance Tyranitar. Generally having an option to pick off faster Pokemon that were at incredibly low health but remained threatening was invaluable, even if the move was resistant thanks to Loom's great attack. Another mark
spark of its usefulness, and a classic example of how priority was often used. When the chips were down, simply going first was sometimes enough, even if the move wasn't very effective, as demonstrated in how Breloom could help pick off that 10% Zapdos, that 12% Salamence, that 14% Starmie, and against neutral targets, the ranges were obviously higher. Breloom was also a great priority user because it wasn't just using Mach Punch defensively, it was also a threat in its own right. If you were switching into its massive Focus Punch, it wouldn't just be enough to survive it, you'd have to withstand the follow-up Mach Punch too. This limited counterplay in that something like Jirachi may have hung on by the skin of its teeth against Focus, but it was still going to get picked off before it could actually attack Breloom. Revenge killing Breloom was tough too. Your Dugtrio or Jolteon better be at high health or down they went. Sometimes Breloom leaned into this fully with a Swords Dance set, another common use of priority. The late game checkmate where it would boost and nothing would be able to withstand its always hit first moves. Now Mach Punch Breloom may have rocked OU, but before players were hip to its potential, Ubers and Yuyu were already awash with priority. Extreme Speed finally had not one, but two excellent users in the form of Rayquaza and especially the most threatening Pokemon in the game, Deoxys Attack. Nothing quite like arguably the ultimate form of priority where two Pokemon fire priority at each other and hoping to win the speed tie. Furthermore, in Yuyu, the lack of Sandstream meant 1 HP Select Berry Reversal Pokemon were among the most dangerous threats around, and thus priority like Quick Attack Scyther and Gligar and Mach Punch Hitmonlee were essential parts of the tier to prevent them from bowling through everything. Furthermore, Belly Drum Extreme Speed Linoon eventually became one of the most terrifying threats in the tier. Difficult to set up, but a ruthless game ender if one managed. However, priority's power and popularity as we know its place in the game today started in Generation 4. Distribution of existing priority moves increased and options for making them stronger increased with the addition of Life Orb accentuating potential move boosts and allowing for more flexibility without the potentially risky, exploitable move restriction of Choice Ban. But most notably, the number of priority moves increased as Generation 4 added a whopping 6 of them. Before we explore them, let's look at how existing priority moves fare. Right on Diamond and Pearl's release, Extreme Speed got its best OU use by far in Lucario. With Swords Dance and Life Orb, it leveraged E-Speed's amazing power for a priority move to become arguably the best late game sweeper in the tier. Effortlessly picking off faster would-be revenge killers, Extreme Speed was just as strong as common moves like Shadow Ball and Dark Pulse, for reference, and to have that level of power moving first was just amazing. Sure, it didn't have super effective targets, but with how hard it hit, all Lucario needed was the neutral coverage. Of course, Extreme Speed wasn't just good for helping Lucario sweep late game. It also loved using the move's power for picking off weak and opposing offensive threats. That Gyarados may have two Dragon Dances, but has also taken some hits. And there's Lucario to finish it off with E-Speed. Lucario was so good, it even used its Swords Dance E-Speed strategy to great effect in Ubers, often alongside a fellow user of the strategy, Rayquaza. Furthermore, with the release of Heart Gold and Soul Silver, Dragonite finally regained its access to Extreme Speed, and it immediately launched it to genuine OU excellence. And remember, this is when Salamence was still in the tier. E Speed was so good, Dragonite immediately ceased to be outclassed by it. Dragonite could run E Speed several different ways. Post Men's Ban, it liked the move even on the speed boosting Dragon Dance sets, because even after a Dragon Dance, it'd still be outrun by Scarfers like Flygon. With E Speed, this was no longer an issue. You. Choice band sets when they weren't spamming Outrage, loved the incredibly strong immediate power of E-Speed, able to revenge kill and clean up weakened threats and teammates. However, even while Mentz was around, Dragonite used a lead-off mix set with Extreme Speed, which was emblematic of a new type of strategy involving priority. The faster pace of Generation 4 made Focus Sash incredibly popular, especially in the lead slot on fast, frail stealth rockers like Azelf and Aerodactyl. In later generations, this would be seen in the form of Sturdy, which was buffed to act as a built-in sash in Gen 5. However, a common way to bypass this was to bring the opponent down to their sash with a slower heavy hitter, and then to finish them off with a priority move afterwards. This was a common dynamic in the lead metagame of many tiers, most notably but certainly not limited to those of Generation 4, and Dragonite was a superb example. Of course, its mix set was also one of the most fearsome attackers in the game, and E-Speed beyond just providing it value for revenge killing a weakened offensive Suicune, or what have you, also 
made it tougher to wall. You might withstand its Draco Meteor barely, but odds were you wouldn't withstand the subsequent E-Speed. Oh, and you know what else used E-Speed in the lean metagame of OU? Raikou, which alongside the rest of the Legendary Beast, received the move in an event in late Heart Gold and Soul Silver. In a similar vein, Entei and Arcanine also used the move to superb effect in Yu Yu. Okay, that's E-Speed. What about Mach Punch? Was it just Breloom? Nope. The newly added Infernape loved using the move. Not only did it make it more of an offensive threat, whether on Choice Band, Mix, or Source Dance sets, by virtue of being able to pick off weakened would-be revenge killers like Scarf Heatran, it was also a superb check to major boosting threats like Agility and Polion, Dragon Dance Tyranitar, and Source Dance Lucario. Remember that Extreme Speed didn't gain boosted priority until Gen 5, so in Gen 4, it was still a matter of the two speed stats of the priority users. Lucario would attempt to E-Speed Ape, which didn't always run Mach Punch, but being able to check Lucario alongside the previously mentioned threats was so good that eventually it became rare to see Infernape without Mach Punch. Indeed, Extreme Speed and Mach Punch were so popular in late game scenarios that it was a major reason why Scarf Rotom appliances were such great Scarfers. It outran threats and it was immune to both those priority moves. Finally, even the oft ignored Fake Out saw better use in Gen 4. Lead Infernape could use it to safely disrupt Rose Ray's Focus Sash, thus blocking its Sleep Powder while also being effective against Lead Empoleon and Azo. In Yu Yu, Hariyama also loved using Fake Out on status orb sets, safely getting free damage on opponents while activating its guts. And later on, its fake out would be guts boosted too. Okay, on to the new priority moves. First off, there was a new priority move that was just as strong as Extreme Speed. It was called Sucker Punch, and it was riskier because it failed if the opponent didn't use a damaging move against you on that turn. The Sucker Punch user's biggest nightmare was facing a substitute Pokemon. However, Sucker Punch was worth this difficulty because it was dark type, meaning it was an E speed strength priority move that had important super effective coverage. And on top of that, it had actually good stab users. That's right, more than one. It was more of a Yu Yu move, but boy was that tier loaded with excellent Sucker Punch. Haunch Crow before it was banned for being absurd in strong part due to Sucker Punch, as well as Hound Doom, Absol, Skunk Tank, and even though it wasn't stabbed, Toxicroak and Kangaskhan were outstanding users of the move as well. Next, Aqua Jet, which provided certain water types an excellent new dimension to their game. In OU, it was most notably used by Empoleon. Despite its initially underwhelming attack stat, it used it to superb effect on its lead set to finish off Focus Sashers it had brought to 1 HP via Hydro Pump, a la the aforementioned Dragonite Extreme Speed. Swords Dance and Polion was also quite good as it would completely catch opposing players expecting standard special and Polion off guard. And now its heavily boosted Aqua Jets were a superb finisher, especially since Empoleon's capacity to take a hit meant it could often get a second Sword Dance. And if it dipped to low enough health, its torrent ability would activate and propel its Aqua Jets to even greater heights. Speaking of Sword Dance, Aqua Jet, and Torrent, this combination alongside a much higher attack stat gave Feraligator a genuine niche in OU, though it was much more at home in Yu Yu, a tier in which Kabutops also wielded Aqua Jet and often Swords Dance alongside it to great effect. Shadow Sneak also gave Ghost Types a new dimension to their game. It wasn't seen much in OU. Dust Noir used it in early Diamond and Pearl, but it then fell out of viability. It was most prominent on attacking lead Gallade, which loved being a fighting type who could strike the likes of Starmie and Rotom appliances with super effective priority. Spiritomb used the move to good effect in Yu Yu, but Shadow Sneak was at its best and most prominent by far in Ubers where Giratina Origin used its amazing attack alongside Grissius Orb's boost to pick off what seemed like everything at low health. It cannot be overemphasized enough how important its presence was to keep the tier's cornucopia of Carnage in check. Its favorite targets were the ghost weak ones, of course, Mewtwo and the Laddie Twins, whom its sneak struck for particularly severe damage, but it was so strong it could finish just about anything. Oh, and we would be remiss to not mention Ariados, which wasn't exactly what you'd call good, but it did have a tiny niche in DP PP Ubers, and part of that niche was finishing off low health Deoxys Speed with Shadow Sneak. Gen 4 OU was dominated by Dragon, and so the Ice type priority of Ice Shard was incredibly welcome. Weavile and Mamoswine were flawed Pokemon, but being able to revenge kill the tier's many dragons, including the ones who went on to get banned, like Garchomp, Latias, and Salamence, was a notable niche. Even after these bans, Ice Shard was valuable for the likes of Dragonite and Flygon, as well as generally the fact that the move was coming off of an impressive attack stat, especially especially Mamoswines, helping pick off neutral low health targets. Though Abomasol wasn't known for its physical attack, its access to Ice Shard was similarly valuable, especially since it could protect for extra hail damage to ensure its target was in range. Even without stab, Donphan could also use the move effectively, expanding its defensive range through being able to strike certain Pokemon first. That's how important priority could be. Generation 4 
Corps also introduced the first ever special priority move, Vacuum Wave. This allowed Nazi Plot and Choice Specs variants of Infernape and Lucario to retain a way to hit first and hit hard. For Infernape, it was just a special variant of Mach Punch, whereas Lucario didn't have Mach, so Vacuum Wave opened up unique possibilities for it. Yu Yu saw Nasty Plot Toxicroak also run Vacuum Wave to great effect. Finally, the biggest for last, Bullet Punch. Yes, there were other users of it. Metagross most famously used it to become one of the most terrifying attacking leads in the game, easily reducing opponents to low health, if not the 1 HP allowed by their Focus Sash, and then finishing them off. But Champ didn't have Stab on the move, but it was its best priority, and it functioned much the same. Swords Dance Lucario also loved wielding Bullet Punch alongside Extreme Speed to pick off Pokemon like Gengar and Scarf Tyranitar that would stifle Extreme Speed. The dual priority also allowed a greater revenge killing options, such as finishing off boosted Dragon Dance Tyranitar. However, Bullet Punch is far and away most famous for single-handedly launching Scizor from Limbo of BL to the most used Pokemon in OU throughout the rest of the generation and one of the best Pokemon of all time. Its mighty attack stat finally had the powerful priority needed to compensate for its underwhelming speed. Not just stab, but boosted by its technician ability as well, so it was functionally hitting with a priority move of 90 base power as opposed to the usual 60 of, say, Metagross's stab bullet punch. This meant Scizor was even out damaging the non-stab extreme speeds and sucker punches. Scizor's bullet punch defined and shaped much of Generation 4 and several generations to come, as its sheer power was an incredible revenge killing and cleanup tactic. When Salamence was around, Scizor's BP kept it in check, as it did just about everything. Oh, and this extended to Ubers too, where Scizor was also an incredibly important Pokemon. Whether it was Source Dancing or Choice Banning, Scizor's Bullet Punch became one of the most defining moves in Pokemon history. Speaking of Technician and Priority, we must mention the Star Yu Yu Pokemon, which made an entire niche out of Priority. Technician Hitmontop, or Technotop. Hitmontop wasn't necessarily beholden to Technician, as Intimidate Rapid Spin sets were excellent, but Technotop was great because it ran three, sometimes even four priority moves. The free damage of Fake Out and the Stab Mach Punch were further boosted by Technician, while Sucker Punch had excellent raw power and great coverage alongside Mach Punch, slamming Ghosts and Psychics super effectively while hitting Poisons and Flyers for strong neutral damage. In the last slot, Top usually ran close combat for a stronger fighting move against slower targets like Registeel or Rapid Spin for utility, but it could also run Bullet Punch. Bullet Punch was usually redundant alongside Mach and Sucker, but it did have the useful niche of hitting Miss Magius and Venusaur without being blanked by status, substitute, or recovery. These moves Gen 4 introduced set the stage for much of how priority would come to look in future generations. Gen 5 didn't introduce any new priority moves, besides those used with the Prankster ability, but that's for the honorary mentions category. But it did buff Extreme Speed to plus 2 priority, meaning Lucario couldn't be stopped by Infernate's faster Mach Punch, and Dragonite couldn't be stopped by faster Ice Shards. The metagame was so fast and so hard hitting, that priority wound up absolutely everywhere on offensive teams, as it was one of the few semi-reliable ways of playing around the endless onslaught of threats bombarding you game in and game out. It was a great example of priority's flexibility, in that while it might not explicitly check something in the way of Scizor's bullet punch might check Terrakion no matter what, but in the sense that it gave you a tool of taking something out once it had been weakened. Like Dragonite's Bandit Extreme Speed, priority was everywhere right from the get-go, with Conkelder's Mach Punch being popular almost solely because it helped against Sandrush Extra Drill, and Azumaro genuinely excelling on rain teams because his Aqua Jet hit so many things hard. Extra Drill landed Anders, Terrakia, Volcarona, an absolute murderer's row of things it kept in check. And in rain, it was an amazing cleaner against neutral targets as well. No other priority was boosted by any of the weather conditions dominating OU, so it was uniquely powerful in this sense. And though it wasn't rain boosted, rain teams also loved Source Dance Toxicroak, wielding its dry skin ability to full effect, and it loved picking off faster Pokemon with Sucker Punch. In Black and White 2, this emphasis on moving first only got more and more extreme, as Breloom gained Technician and was suddenly dishing out Mach Punch is on par with Scizor's Bullet Punch, becoming one of the scariest threats in the tier. For Alligator made a splash in OU as an alternative to Azumarill, with its Swords Dance set being rediscovered as a monster under rain. Priority shown in every capacity in Gen 5. Defensive use, making its users harder to wall, Mana Swine and Focus Punch Breloom were particularly brutal examples, and endgame sweeping. It was so important, Terrakion was semi-regularly used Quick Attack. Sure, it wasn't exactly flooded with amazing options beyond its stabs, but an unstabbed priority that hits nothing super effectively? Hey, what else is going to pick off that weakened Revenge Killer? Like the damaged Scarf Landers? Priority was so important, Keldeo would sub Sometimes use Aqua Jet despite its near uselessness against almost everything else because hitting Sash Alakazam at 1 HP was just that important. 
Generation 6 introduced several new forms of priority. Baby doll eyes and water shuriken didn't really do anything. The latter seemed intriguing with its multi-hit nature, but it was a physical move, so its intended user Greninja couldn't really use it well. But Gale Wings providing priority Brave Bird and Roost for that matter made Talonflame one of the most defining Pokemon in OU. So it spammed it and earned the nickname Smogenbird. It wasn't the only Pokemon introducing flying type priority to the world either. Mega Pinsir, with whom Talonflame was often paired with had quick attack as its priority but it also had the aerolate ability meaning quick attack was transformed into flying stab and was given a power boost so it hit incredibly hard the two love spamming swords dance flying priority together sometimes banded in talon flames case and they defined much of the tier in doing so gen 6 also saw sucker punch finally become a commonly spammed priority move dark was no longer resisted by steel and bisharp and mega mawile took advantage of this beautifully with game ending swords dance boosted sucker punches bypassing their low speed. Mega Mawile did this so well that it was banned, even though it didn't even have stab on sucker punch. It was so strong it outright damaged extreme killer's E speed. Megas and priority were generally a terror. Parental bond Mega Kangaskhan also smacked opponents with its twice hitting sucker punch, and the doubled free damage of fake out was similarly ferocious, while Mega Lucario's extreme speeds, bullet punches, and vacuum waves were also monstrous. Kangaskhan and Lucario were so good, they also excelled in Ubers. Speaking of mega priority that was valuable in OU and Ubers alike, Scizor got a mega which also had Technician, making its bullet punches better than ever. Mega Metagross also wielded Tough Claws boosted bullet punch to superb effect, picking off faster revenge killers left and right, from Scarf Tyranitar to Banded Weavile to Mega Alakazam. Mega Metachamp's own bullet punch was also a tremendous tool in an identical vein, making up for lack of a stab with sheer power, and its ability to so devastate Mega Deante was a thing of beauty. Alongside Fake Out, Mega Metachamp's double priority assault meant it would always find use. Double priority Mega Lopany was outstanding as well. The free damage from Fake Out, as well as stab on both Fake Out and Quick Attack, allowed it to keep a tremendous number of boosting threats in check. During its tenure in the tier, Aegislash also wielded the previously rare Shadow Sneak to incredible effect. It was a perfect example of priority making its offensive onslaught harder to wall, as you might barely withstand its stab Shadow Ball, only 80 base power after all, but it it wouldn't matter since it just sneak you afterwards. Greninja also enjoyed the occasional Protean boosted Shadow Stick. Breloom's Mach Punch was similar. If it launched a massive Focus Punch with Stealth Rock up, something like Latios or Tornadus Therian might withstand it barely, but they wouldn't take the Mach Punch afterwards. Furthermore, Azumarill became an effective OU choice. Its Bandit Aqua Jets were still so strong, even without permanent rain, but the real threat it posed was with Belly Drum, which was a potential game ender. Finally, the Rise of Weavile, now brandishing new offensive weapons in Icicle Crash and Buff Knockoff meant Ice Shard continued to have an important place in the tier. Generation 7 brought a few new forms of priority. First Impression, a much stronger Bug-type fakeout, was wielded to superb effect by Golisopod and Aryu, while Lycan Rock Dusk wielded Swords Dance boosted Accelerock Rock in the same tier. Gen 7 also brought notable changes to pre-existing priority. One, Sucker Punch was nerfed from 80 to 70 base power. This made Mega Mawile slightly more palatable, but not by much, it got pretty close to being banned again, and one has to imagine that an unnerfed Sucker Punch might have pushed it over the edge. The other change was to Water Shuriken, which was now special, allowing Greninja to actually use it effectively. And if it managed to transform into Ash Greninja, each hit would go up from 15 to 20 base power, and it would hit a minimum of three times. This was a major contributing factor to Greninja, being one of the most elite Pokemon around. Not only was it an apt revenge killer for weakened Pokemon, if it was actually permitted to get that KO, it would transform. As if that wasn't enough, Greninja was also a fixture on rain teams, which made its shurikens downright game ending very, very quickly. It was immensely difficult to stop, but Generation 7 also brought a new dynamic to the priority world, as for the first time ever under certain conditions, one couldn't just freely water shuriken with Greninja or bullet punch with Mega Scizor, or whatever priority move, because Tapu Lele's psychic terrain actually blocked priority. This incredibly powerful trait became a significant part of the metagame. Scarf Tapu Lele was such a fierce cleaner against offense in large part due to the fact that you couldn't bypass it with priority, and its terrain support extended to fast teammates like Mega Alakazam, which also loved when they couldn't be threatened by such moves. One had to be particularly careful with priority moves when facing Tapu Lele for this reason, as if the task of withstanding its hits wasn't enough. The power of negating priority moves serves to illustrate the power priority moves pack in the first place. That said, priority continued to be an important part of the 
the tier, as Tapu Lele wasn't exactly omnipresent and it could be played around, for instance, with different terrains on one's own team. Thus, the likes of Greninja, Mega Mawile, Mega Lopunny, Mega Scizor, and occasionally Weavile were able to rely on their priority. Generation 8 shifted some of the previous few generations' dynamics of priority. No more Megas, no more Ash Greninja, but certain tried and true classics remained significant, such as Base Scizor's Bullet Punch and Weavile's Ice Shard. The latter was especially important for keeping the monstrous Dragapult in check. So too was Sucker Punch, which came as stab from two Pokemon that wound up banned, Urshifu and Libero Cinderace. Aqua Jet was a big one as well, coming from Urshifu Rapid Strike. It was particularly useful for taking down Volcarona and Blaziken. Tapu Lele's Psychic Terrain was also a major factor once again, but it was also competing with other terrains, and one of them, Grassy Terrain, was now directly related to priority itself. Rillaboom had Grassy Glide, which was massively strong for a priority move at 70 base power, but it only had priority on the move under Grassy Terrain. However, seeing as Rillaboom's Grassy Surge set the terrain up, this wasn't a problem, and it also meant that Grassy Grassy Glide was functionally stronger than its already powerful 70 base power because it was receiving a 30% boost from the terrain it needed for its priority. This helped make Rillaboom an excellent Pokemon in Gen 8 OU. Before we finish things off with Generation 9, we have some honorable mentions in the field of priority. We briefly mentioned Prankster earlier, and it is unique for giving priority to non-attacking moves, something that otherwise doesn't exist save for protection moves and baby doll eyes. Prankster has allowed Thunderous's Thunder Wave to check Pokemon far faster than it. Sableye to Willowis and recover before you can hit it, and Clef Key to lay spikes among others. Other similar abilities are Quick Draw, whose 30% chance to move first is potentially lethal on the likes of boosting Galarian Slowbro and Triage, whose priority healing moves forms the crux of Comfy's viability. Funnily enough, the item Quick Claw is often banned for reasons similar to Bright Powder's Evasion Raise. Cuss That Berry is an excellent item, which gives Pokemon the ability to move first, discounting opposing priority moves the first turn after they have dropped to 25% or lower health, and it doesn't reveal itself to the opponent until its use, meaning it is a tremendous surprise item. It was especially popular and useful on Generation 4 Machamp, which turned to its advantage of how often it was knocked to low health, bypassing its low speed for an unexpected kill. There is also negative priority. Usually moving first is what you want, but not always, and this is beautifully exemplified amplified in Teleport, whose moving second is what allows it to bring its teammates without sustaining any sort of damage at all. This can also be done with U-Turn, Vault Switch, or Flip Turn with Lagging Tail as the item. Or you can bestow negative priority on your opponent by tricking them a Lagging Tail. And finally, we come to Generation 9, which has had some of the strongest priority ever. Ice Shard first appeared on the defensive lowering Chien Pao. For it to have been banned and go back to a metagame where Weavile is throwing Ice Shards is a blessed relief by comparison, and Weavile is no slouch. Neither is the returning Grassy Glide Rillaboom. But oh, there's more. Before its ban, there was also Jet Punch Palafin, which was Game Freak's answer to the question, what if we made Aqua Jet but stronger and gave it to a Pokemon with freakishly high attack? Yeah, that one was egregious. But what about something that didn't get banned? King Gambit managed to avoid the ban hammer, but it was close. Its Sucker Punch is frighteningly strong, and that's before you consider its Supreme Overlord ability, which turns into a comeback mechanic, able to transform its fainted teammates into stronger priority with which to cleave through everything in its path, especially after a Swords Dance. Oh, and it's not the only big Sucker Punch around anymore. Raging Bolt has a special Electric-type Sucker Punch clone, which goes beautifully with its base 137 special attack, slightly higher than King Gambit's attack, and the fact that Raging Bolt often boosts its special attack further via Protosynthesis, let alone Calm Mind. In a game as strong and as fast-paced as Gen 9, priority is incredibly important for both defense and offense, whether it's Raging Bolt checking a stellar Terra Scarf Enamorous with Thunderclap, or King Gambit winning a game with insanely boosted Sucker Punches after his five teammates have fainted, priority has continued to be one of the most important parts of the game. And that's it! We've gone over why speed is so close to everything before, and priority is a unique extension of that, since it can apply to so many different Pokemon. You don't need a huge speed stat or a speed boosting move, or Choice Scarf, or even Trick Room. You can just click the move that goes first. Priority really exploded onto the scenes in Generation 4, and it's been a major part of the game in so many ways ever since. From keeping opposing threats in check to maximizing the threat of your own Pokemon, it's always advantageous to have priority in your corner. Scizor was the poster Pokemon for this, with its access to Bullet Punch completely changing the game. It was the perfect example of many ways priority affected the game, even transcending standard play and being used in Ubers. 
in both its base and mega form. Let us know what your favorite types of priority are, whether we mention them or not, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching, everyone. And as always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos. And thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.